Great to be back. Good to see everyone. I hope you've had a great week. Uh, hopefully sharing the good news about Jesus with friends and people you know. Uh, something about me is I recently started playing tennis again. Uh, I love tennis. I started playing as a kid. And uh, I'm actually not half bad. I'm in a league and I've yet to lose a match, so it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> I've only played two matches, but you know, I still think I'm pretty good. <laughs> Uh, this past week, I got to play my third match. It was against this guy, an older guy named Ken. And I beat him, but that's not why I'm sharing the story. After we finished playing, we got to talking a little bit. And he asked me, you know, what I do for a living. And I said, well, I work in ministry. And it didn't take too long before I was listening to him uh, tell me all about his beliefs. And then he told me that he was agnostic, that he believes in some superior power, but not exactly uh, God the way that we believe, the way the same God Christians believe in. But we had this great discussion. I got to share why Jesus is valuable in my life and a little bit about why Jesus should matter to him as well. Mm-hmm. And he seemed really encouraged, you know, and he asked, you know, if, like, if it would be okay if he emailed me some questions later on. I'm like, absolutely, no problem. But the reason I shared it is I want us always to be thinking how God might want to use you to introduce someone to Jesus. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just beat this guy in tennis, but we're still able to talk about eternal things. <laughs> And this is the requirement of the church, right? That we are the sent out ones. We're sent out to share his good news all over the world, anywhere, everywhere, to anyone and everyone. And it's not like you need to be a pastor to do what I did, right? We were playing tennis and talking. I didn't write some kind of fancy sermon. I just said, here's what I love about Jesus. And I just want to encourage you, church, if you're, if you're not already trying to tell people about Jesus, you've got to try it today. Because it's like, it's seriously, it's just the best thing. But... That's a lot of talk about the good news of Jesus. This morning, we're going to start a new series I'm calling Battles. And this first week's going to start with some bad news, but it sets the foundation for everything else. And I'm going to end on a positive note, so just stick with me. But in this series, we're going to take a look at several literal and figurative battles the people of God have experienced. Through each one, we're going to encounter lessons on how the individuals handle that situation, and more importantly, will observe God's role in each battle, to be reminded and encouraged about how God is actively at work in our own battles today. Now remember, God wants to show off his glory, right? So we can have a better understanding of how good he is, how great he is, and enjoy him even more. So let's go ahead and dive in, starting at the very beginning. A battle that would set the stage for every battle ever in the history of time. Adam and Eve and the forbidden fruit. I'm going to read a large part of the story, so follow along with me on the slides behind me or in your Bible. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be at verse 24. And we're going to kind of go through a bit of chapter 3, and then we're going to skip into uh, chapter 20. But here we go. We're going to start Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit. And ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. 
He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, uh, the, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, uh, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. We're going to skip ahead a couple verses here. We're going to be in verse 20 now. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay, so there's actually a ton of truth to unpack in these verses. I even skipped over several. There's a, we could do a, several sermons just on those. But it's more than we have time for this morning. What I want to draw your attention to is the tough lesson that Adam and Eve had to learn. Disobedience to God leads to significant consequences. I mean, they were sent out of the Garden of Eden. They had to leave a perfect paradise and instead enter into a hardened world or sin ran rampant. In this battle, Adam and Eve lost the first round. God would see to it that his people would one day be fully reunited with him. It wasn't like a two ahead of ourselves just yet. This morning, we're going to see that no matter what battle you're facing right now, no matter how dark the circumstances appear to be, failure is never final because God. You might be fighting against a bad habit and you've You've given up hope thinking you'll never change. Or maybe you're fighting against a circumstance that seems totally against you and out of your control, and you just know that each day you're losing ground. Or maybe you've already fought and totally lost. You failed. You said the words you wish you hadn't. You did the thing you wish you didn't. But failure is never final because of God. Even if you're here this morning, you're not sure what to think about God and all this, I'm excited to tell you, failure is never final because God will restore and redeem. Now, we already know that he sent his son to die for us. And through Adam and Eve's story, this morning we're going to see what it means specifically for God to restore and redeem us in our battles today. So we're going to take a look at our first observation from this passage, our first point this morning. Unrepentant sin leads to more sin. Amen. So before I move on, I want to make sure that we all clearly understand the word unrepentant, like what it means. Because this is one of those church words that I think we need to be able to explain clearly to any of our friends who might not go to a church. You see, unrepentant simply means that you have not admitted fault in your action, and you have no desire or see no reason to confess that you've disobeyed God. To be unrepentant is to voluntarily, willfully continue to choose sin. But see, repentance leads the Christian to first feel remorse or regret for their actions. It'd be like saying to someone, I'm sorry. But then repentance goes another step further. Repentance also means a change in behavior. You confess before God your sin, and then you cease to repeat that sin. This is like saying, I'm sorry, then saying, and I'll never do it again, and then never doing it again. You see, when Jesus encountered the woman caught in adultery, yes, he showed her grace, but he also challenged her with his words, go and sin no more. In our case with Adam and Eve, we clearly see their first sin. They, they eat the forbidden fruit. But rather than repent and confess to God their wrongdoing, they follow a self-destructive path. You see, first they eat the fruit. Then they try to cover themselves. Then they try to hide from God. Then Adam blames God. And then he blames Eve. And Eve blames the snake. It's just one giant mess. Their unrepentant sin led to even more sin. And let's be honest, this tends to happen in our own lives as well. Well, let's take a look at another person who experienced a similar situation. King David, mighty David, who defeated Goliath with a sling 
and a stone. Wonderful David, who God affectionately declared as a man after his own heart. This same David invited unrepentant sin into his life, and not even he could escape the self-destructive nature of sin. The story plays out like this. So King David is relaxing in his palace rather than going off to war with his army, which was the norm, which was the custom in that time. And from his palace view, he's gawking at this beautiful woman bathing on her rooftop. She was the wife of one of David's friends and a leader in his army, a man named Uriah. David succumbs to his lust for her. He has her Bathsheba brought to his chambers and he sleeps with her. When David finds out that she's pregnant, he, he lies and tries to cover it up. He, he develops this little scheme where he calls Uriah back from war and tries to get him drunk and, and send him home to sleep with his wife to try to cover up the pregnancy. And when that fails, David issues a secret military order to allow for Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, to be killed in battle. Mm. The life cycle of sin is simple and ought to terrify us all. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's James 1, 15. Friends, we must not allow ourselves to be so neutral, so calm around even the tiniest hint of sin in our lives. You know, sure, maybe you didn't plot to have your friend murdered or, you know, maybe you're like, Scott, whoa, whoa, like, I'm not that bad. You know, I've heard people say this all the time. I'm not like a, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a horrible person. You know, I'm not like Hitler. You know, I'm like, oh, way to set the bar high. You, know, you haven't committed genocide lately. Way to go. <laughs> But no, church, when we see David, a man who knew God intimately, fall victim to sin in such a tragic way, we must fairly evaluate ourselves and realize how much danger we put ourselves and our loved ones into each time we invite sin into our life. You know, the worst part is in hindsight, it always looks ridiculous. But in the middle of sin, we think we're being clever. We think, oh, it, it's fine, it's okay, you know, it's under control, I can handle it. No, you can't. I mean, honestly, Adam tried to hide from God in the same garden that God created. Like, seriously, that's just as bad as uh, this one time. I remember I was uh, 18 or something. I was in high school. I got really mad on the phone with my mom. And I hung up, and I just threw it across the living room, tried to hit the couch. And it went a little higher than the couch and went through the wall. So I made this massive hole in the wall. I thought to myself, man, my mom's going to freak out. So I move the couch, and I move a recliner and put it over there and cover the hole, and the couch is kind of hanging out in the middle of the room. And you should have seen my mom's face when she got home from work and was like, what the heck is the chair doing over there, Scott? And why is the couch in the middle of the living room? I thought I wasn't going to get caught. I, I don't know. <laughs> Be honest with yourselves about the sin you get into and turn away from it as soon as possible. Don't even let a hint of it linger. And this goes for your relationships, too. Be encouraged that when the Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you got a husband, a wife, novio, babe, boo, honey, whatever you call them. When you have a fight, whether it was healthy or unhealthy, make sure you do everything you can to reconcile. Paul writes this in Ephesians. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. See, we have to seek to find reconciliation as soon as we can. Don't be angry for an unreasonable amount of time and allow that anger to become sinful. By doing so, we give the devil an opportunity to plant more seeds of self-destructive sin into our lives. Sin will always lead to death. Paul wrote in Romans that the wages of sin are death. Even in the case with Adam and Eve, they experienced two deaths. A spiritual death in the introduction of sin into the world, and then a very literal death of some animals when God made clothes of animal skins for them. You see, sin wants only to lie, steal, and destroy everything and everyone in your life. The consequence might not even affect you. It might not even take place for years, but it will come. Sin only knows destruction, not mercy. But we have to be cautious here. We cannot allow ourselves to fall into a common trap of making this some kind of burden to place on ourselves. And I fear too many Christians 
find themselves struggling to simply avoid sin or to even try to be perfect. In fact, when I first learned about uh, Christianity and being a Christian in college, I thought that meant that I needed to stop sinning like forever. And at the time, I only knew of a couple like obvious sins, like don't get drunk and don't cuss and don't steal things. And I'm totally serious when I say this. I, I remember I was like in my dorm, and I, I kept a little calendar. I tracked for like the next 27 days. <laughs> Y'all, I was doing it. I didn't, I didn't drink or cuss. I wasn't stealing anything. And then, I don't know, something bad happened on day 28. I got mad and said something I shouldn't have. And, and I messed it all up. But guys, I felt so stressed that entire time. Trying to be perfect is exhausting. <laughs> And I think this is another reason why so many people maybe get burned out in Christianity. Maybe some church or some Christian somewhere told them that the most important thing they have to do to be a true Christian is <coughs> behave properly on the outside. <coughs> but the problem is, you can be the nicest, most polite, well-mannered person in the world and still end up in hell. In fact, if you spend your entire life avoiding every sin but you never have a relationship with Jesus, you're not going to heaven. It's not based on how good you are. It's about how good Jesus is and him sharing that gift of his righteousness with you. He wants you to have it. Will you accept it? Jesus wants a relationship with you. It's why we must seek the kingdom of God first. This is our second point this morning. Seek first the kingdom of God. You know, in the middle of losing battles, there is a right way and a wrong way to respond. Adam and Eve lost that. I mean, it's a talking snake. Like, it's a bummer they didn't have Netflix or Disney Plus back then because I've seen enough movies to know you don't ever trust a talking snake. <laughs> Obviously, I'm being a little harsh on them, but still, they had one rule to follow. Just one rule. And they messed up. They lost. But I think we've all been there too. We did the dumb thing. We lost control for just a second. You know, okay, it happened, right? But what we do next is equally, if not more, important. And we cannot do what Adam and Eve did. Notice all of their actions were centered on themselves. They were totally preoccupied with their own worries and fears and vulnerabilities. Adam and Eve started pointing fingers at everyone but themselves. This is the wrong way to do it. And Christians today, I think we let it happen all the time. Just yesterday, both of my daughter's soccer teams lost their games. And because they're four and five years old, they stopped caring about the score after they ran through the 30-foot tunnel the parents made for them. <laughs> However, their 31-year-old man-child coach pouted about it for several hours afterward. <laughs> You know, I just kept thinking all these like negative thoughts about myself, or I was upset that maybe I didn't prepare the team. I mean, there are four, five years old, so I'm not talking about but I get really into it. Um, and I was upset that maybe I didn't prepare the team better that week, and, and honestly, my focus was on myself and not on God. Jesus warns us against this during his Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus was trying to encourage his audience against allowing their worries to overwhelm them. He gave them this truth. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You see, Jesus gives us a solution to how we fight back against the pain of loss, the agony of worrisome defeat. When we are in a losing battle, our minds quickly shift to personal worries. Self-centered focus that sounds like one giant pity party, or its close cousin, a bitter party, where we just get mad at everything and we're consumed with how unfair it all is. Jesus challenges us to realign our priorities to God and to seek his kingdom first. You know, there may be a lot of things to worry about and that you need to resolve, but the first thing that cannot be missed, the thing that cannot be put off until tomorrow, is that you go to God in prayer and ask him to rule in your life first. Amen. Open your Bible. Pick up wherever you last read, and read some more and ask God to teach you his wisdom. Pick up your phone, call or text a mature Christian friend. Ask them to pray for you. Seek their Christian wisdom. Open up YouTube or a podcast and listen to a sermon from a pastor you trust and respect. And all these things, you are making God's influence and authority the number one priority in your life. You have to make a choice, friend. Your feelings or your faith. Which one will win out? 
Feelings are powerful, but they are not strong enough to build your life around. I want to give you a little more truth. When you find yourself in the middle of a losing battle like Adam and Eve, Satan is going to come at you with a lot of shame, like, like a ton of shame. This is his pattern, okay? It's, it's really messed up. But here's how Satan likes to work on people. First, he takes your eyes off God. He can't have you thinking about the kingdom of God. He doesn't want you to focus on God's leadership in your life. This can be really subtle or obvious. It might be, maybe you're just feeling a little hungry in the middle of your devotional time. Or maybe you're trying to pray and uh, you're trying to pray to God and you keep getting distracted with the washing machine or some other to-do list item comes up in your head. You see, once he's gotten you distracted, he's going to try to tempt you with something. And say, he's good at this, y'all. He's been doing this for thousands of years. Let's take a look at Eve. First, he tried to get her to doubt God. Then he uses this, this kind of this threefold system, this pattern that he does often. You can see it when he does it with Jesus later on. But we're going to take a look at Eve. First, the fruit looks good for food. He's trying to appeal to this physical value of the It gives you this physical value for your body. Then Eve said, the fruit was a delight to the eyes. Well, now he's trying to appeal to the visual beauty of it. Some may have called it the lust of the eyes. And third, the fruit could make one wise. He's trying to appeal to her pride, her sense of self-worth, as though God's love for her wasn't enough. Satan will use one or all three of these things in some variety to tempt you into thinking that a particular sin is a good thing. Maybe it's pornography, you know, delights of the eyes, a physical pleasure. Maybe it's stopping at happy hour instead of going straight home like you said you were going to. Another physical pleasure. Maybe it's sharing a few he said, she said rumors with family members or coworkers. It's a little gossip to put someone down and feel good about yourself. Another appeal to your pride. This is why the name Satan literally means deceiver. And here's the thing, guys. After you commit to that sin, sometimes Satan likes to hit you with a one-two punch. Now he's going to shame you for it. He's going to whisper thoughts into your mind about how disgusting you are, how worthless you are. He wants to shame you for doing the very thing he told you was a good thing to do. He wants to use that shame to keep you trapped in self-centered thinking. It's why Adam and Eve felt ashamed of their nakedness. They both fell into sin and they lost trust for each other. They were worried about how the other might assault their vulnerabilities. They needed to be covered. Then they hid from God because they couldn't imagine him loving him, loving them after they sinned. Then they tried to blame someone else as if they could convince God to not be mad at them, but instead direct his wrath elsewhere as though God doesn't delight in mercy. Friends, it's imperative that when we fall down, when we mess up, when we are in the middle of losing, do not, let me say it again, do not run away and hide from God. Run to God. Amen. Confess that sin on bended knee and watch him forgive you with wave after wave of grace. It might be scary at first because that shame comes fast. But it's all pride. That pride will either try to lead you to think you're too far gone for God to rescue. Or that pride will try to lead you to think you're too good enough. That you're good enough to handle it on your own. You don't actually need God. Both thoughts are prideful. And they accuse God of not being able to help. This is a lie. This is deception. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God. Make your entire life the king's dominion. That's what kingdom is, right? The place where the king has complete power. See, I, I want God to always have complete power in my life. So when I'm losing... I'm losing. I just got to admit that I got my butt kicked. And humbly come before God and seek his rule in my life. When I'm making decisions, I'm, I'm holding the steering wheel and I drive myself into a ditch. But you know what, guys? I have my wife and my two daughters that God has called me to love. And my destination, where I'm leading them, where God wants me to take them, is too important to keep driving into ditches. How many of you got some important people in your life that need you? Your life is too important to keep going from, you know, sin-filled ditch to sin-filled ditch. Call on God. Seek his kingdom first. This is our responsibility. And when it's partnered with God's promise, I can assure you it will never be in vain. 
God will never make a fool out of you for trusting in him. And let me show you why. Our last point this morning, God restores and redeems us. Amen. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is at a home having just finished sharing a meal with uh, tax collectors and, and sinners is what the word says. The religious leaders of the day were watching all of this completely in shock. They were questioning and, and condescending Jesus' actions. When Jesus heard it, he responded with wise words and gave this rebuke to the misguided men. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. This is of supreme importance that we correctly understand this truth about God because it explains his actions toward Adam and Eve at the end of their battle and it gives us the evidence we need to trust that our failure is never final. Jesus' words here, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, is actually, excuse me, is actually a quote from Hosea chapter 6. Jesus would have known that these religious leaders were well-versed in Old Testament teaching. He wanted them to be challenged by an obvious truth they had since forgotten. A mistake we can't afford to make. You see, in Hosea, God asks the prophet Hosea to take a prostitute for a wife. It's a rough marriage, to say the least. She cheats on him, humiliates him, and the husband eventually has to go find her in the city and buy back his own wife from another man so she can come live at home with him again. But the purpose of the entire ordeal is for God to illustrate his love for the Israelites, who, like the misguided bride, continue to run off and worship other lovers, false gods. These people, these Israelites who were totally in the wrong, barely knew how to apologize to God and come back to him. But what is God's response to these weak, sin-filled people? God says to them, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God says, I desire to give you mercy, not require some list of demands or atoning sacrifices from you. As a youth pastor, it would always happen the same way. I would see a student who, who had been absent for several weeks, and the first thing they would say to me almost every time was, oh, Scott, I'm so sorry. I've been so busy. I haven't been able to come. And you know, ex 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 explanation for me. And I would, I, would, I would say to them, it's okay. You don't have to explain yourself. I'm just so glad you're here. Amen. I always try to reassure them that I'm just glad to see them again. You see, when you mess up, God is not some arm-crossed parent just waiting to dish out punishment on you. He is, he wants to give you mercy. He delights in it for the best of us and the worst of us. God wants to give mercy, not demand some kind of repayment from you. Now, don't get this mixed up. Remember, it's mercy not sacrifice. But how easy is it for us to think mercy and sacrifice? But that way of thinking cannot be true. When Jesus says he delights in mercy, Jesus wants you to know this good news and let it rule in your heart. You see, in the battles we face, we might find that we are losing. But remember, Jesus desires mercy, not sacrifice. Your failure isn't final. Back to Adam and Eve. They lost. They blew it. But God makes for them clothing. It's made from the skins of animals. And already we recognize that these animals had to die in order for this to happen. It's a sad effect of sin on this new world. But here's what we need to focus on. At first, Adam and Eve tried to make clothing for themselves from, from fig leaves. But God rejected this attempt and in his mercy, he made better clothing for them. Of his own doing, he got involved and offered a better solution for Adam and Eve. This one act foreshadows a far greater sacrifice God would one day make for us. Like the story in Hosea, the husband having to buy back his wife, God would buy us back. But not with the blood of animals, like in Adam and Eve's case. Instead, it would be God rejecting man's attempts to fix our sin, and he would shed the blood of his own son in the greatest mercy to us to, have, to give us a better solution, a permanent solution to the sin of all mankind for all time. God's love for you and me restores us from shame. 
His love redeems, buys us back from the eternal punishment of our sin. Adam and Eve were clothed in animal skins, but because of the blood of Jesus, we are clothed in a robe of righteousness. We have reason to rejoice. Even in failure, we have reason to rejoice and hope. Seek first the kingdom of God and know this merciful love that God has for every one of us. I started off this morning with bad news, but there's good news for the follower of Jesus. Your failure is never final because God restores you to his family and redeems you with his love. I want to show this video behind me really quick for a few minutes. And then I'm going to come back and talk about a few more things. Hey, Dad, it's Mark. I, uh, I know I, I'm probably the last person you're expecting to hear from right now. But I'm, uh, I'm home. Now you're home. I'm actually standing on your front porch. I, uh, Look, I just want to tell you that I know I haven't been, you know, the best son. Look, I guess what I'm trying to say is, and I'm so I'm sorry for that, Dad. You know what? I don't know what I'm doing. All right, you've been fine without me. You know, I'm sure you continue to be fine without me. I uh. I won't bother you no more, Dad. All right. I'm just sorry. Sorry about everything. Bye.
because I don't I don't know what your life has been like. I don't know what the people who you love life has been like. But don't ever for a second think that you're too far gone, that they're too far to be saved, that there's not hope for them, that God isn't running to you, running to them, willing to save them, hug them, bring them in with arms wide open. He would, He's the king of kings, and he came to earth in the form of a man born as a baby to bring you into a relationship with him. There's nothing he won't do for you. Your failure is never final, and don't for a second listen to anyone who ever tells you otherwise. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this story. Thank you for the fact that you have already forgiven us before we've even asked. Lord, let us never give up. Let us never go into hiding. Lord, there is no place we can go from your love. There is no valley too deep, no place we can hide, no mountain too high. Lord, you are in all things, and your love is beckoning us. Lord, inspire our hearts. If we know this hope already, let it, let it not end with us. Let us not put a period at the end of this truth, but Lord, give us a comma that we can take this truth and share it with the people who need it most. Shame, guilt, it destroys people's mental health. People take their own lives because they think their life is hopeless and pointless, but God, you love them. Burden our hearts to love your children the way you do. Let us not, for fear of ridicule or upsetting someone or offending them, not share this great hope that we've learned this morning. That God, Adam and Eve, who were once clothed in animal skins, Lord, you did one even better when you sent your son to pour out his blood that we may be clothed in robes of righteousness. Our failure is never final. Satan has already lost. We stand in victory. And even when we're losing, Jesus, you won. And you share that victory with us. Let us be excited by that, empowered by that, and let it be the reason that we share this gospel message, that there is hope in the name of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes.